Welcome back to our video module on statics. We've been covering two-dimensional and three-dimensional supports and what we'd like to do now is take a look at how we would actually use those to do a problem. Now what I've done here is I've created a problem. Let's take a look at it. We have a shaft going along this distance. At the end of this shaft is a lever arm and you're pulling down on that or pushing down on it or a weight is attached to 20 pounds. Now this it's at 30 degrees to the horizon. This will come in, you know, we'll have to figure out what that means. The lever arm is three feet long. Now, all these are in feet. And then over on this side there's a disc and that disc has this, uh, this greenish rope. And what that means is that the rope is attached at this point right here. Well, anytime you see a rope going around the outside of a disc, that means that the tension is directed along the tangent of the disc. So we have this rope being attached and the tension's on the disc. It's trying to twist it, the shaft one direction, the weight is shifting it the other. And then you have these, um, these, these bearings. Well, these bearings, per our conversation before, they're going to have a force supporting everything. They're also going to have a, be able to pre, uh, react with a torque, but what they cannot do is they are not going to keep the shaft from traveling in this direction, the Z direction, and they're not going to um, keep any rotation from happening. So any moment or any torque or any force in the Z direction, they will not fight. However, they will fight you know, we can write it in, they'll, they'll fight, uh, they'll have a reaction vertically, a reaction horizontally, both of them will. And if you want to uh, truly kind of dot your I's and cross your T's, they'll also prevent torque in the X direction or they'll react with torque in the X direction, react with torque in the Y direction. Let's figure out how to solve this. First things first create your free body diagram. Let's not be lazy about this. I think you can get through this problem. You, sh you have all the tools you'll need. So go ahead and put the video on pause when you're ready. If you'd like, see how far you can get on your own and regroup and we'll see where we're at. Let's pull up the free body diagram. Now you can see that on my free body diagram, I have taken off the lever arm and I've also taken off this disc. And the reason I've done that is I like having one long shaft. Now, of course, I can't just take it off, right? I have to use my equivalent systems. Well, I know that I have 20 pounds going down this way, so I made 20 pounds going down right here. But in addition, that 20 pounds generated a torque. That torque was 52 foot-pounds. Let's write down how I got that. There we go. So we know that it's exercised at three feet, but because that three feet is at a 30 degree angle, we're only looking at this portion of its distance. Um, so you multiply that by 20. If you want to do F cross R and um, put it into a, uh, a fully vector format, that's totally fine too. You'll get up, you'll end up with the same answer. I've basically done the, the same concept at uh, D where I've said that's the same as applying the tension, push it, remember transmissibility, pushing on the rod in this direction and applying a torque. So now what are we going to do with this? What are we going to do with this? we are noticed that um, at B and C we have a torque in the X and the Y direction. Well let's sum the torques in the Z direction. If we sum the torques in the z direction, it becomes really easy. We see that the torque here is 52 foot-pounds and the torque here is unknown and the sum of them must be zero. So now we know that this right here is negative 52 foot-pounds or basically 52 foot-pounds in the negative z direction. Well, let's pull up the equation that from there figure out the tension. Here we go, torque about A. I, I've kind of changed things here, so maybe this should be A and this should be something like E, uh, but you get the same idea. Plus torque of D equals zero, 52 foot-pounds, plus torque at D equals zero, 52, we already covered that, 69 pounds is the tension. Now, the next thing we're going to try and conquer, now the next thing we are going to conquer 
is the force at B and the force at C. And this is a pretty straightforward one. Let's see what we can do. All right, the first thing I'm going to know is I have two unknowns here, right? What's happening at B and what's happening at C. So I'm going to take out one of those unknowns by saying, let's rotate everything about the C direction. That means whatever forces that are being applied at C, I don't care about. So I'm going to say, what's the sum of the torques about C? I'm just being arbitrary here. Let's just say in the X direction. So think about how that works. Torque in the X direction. Take a look at how that's going to go. What's going to make it rotate in uh, in this direction? And basically, that means you're going to have the 20 pounds pushing down. Okay, that's going to be one torque. The other force that's going to or that's going to cause one torque. The other force that's going to cause a torque in the X direction is the B is the B force. So the force we're saying applied at A times the radius from C to A minus, because it's in the negative direction, the force at B in the y direction times the radius from C to B equals zero. Now note that I did arbitrarily identify the forces at B and C in operating in these directions. That's fine. What that means is we're going to make sure it stays in those directions on our equations, and if we end up with a negative, we know that it goes in the opposite direction. We plug in our numbers here, we get 30 equals the force of B in the Y direction. Now, those of you who are being uh, careful about what I wrote down here will realize that something's somewhat fishy here. And the thing that's fishy is I said the sum of the torques in about C in the X direction equals zero. Well, you're thinking, wait a minute, the, the, um, the bearings can also apply a torque in the X direction. The bearing at B, the bearing at C, they both can do this. Yes, that's true. In this situation, and generally, what, what you would have is the bearings would not do that. In general use, they if you have two bearings set up so that they're linear, they're not going to be applying any significant torque. The real type of um, influence is going to be, reaction is going to be these forces. So I've played a little bit fast and loose, and what that basically means, or what that does mean, is that I am saying that relatively, because these two um, bearings are in line, that the torque in the y direction and the torque in the x direction is basically negligible. It's zero. You can ignore it. Now, how do you know when to do that and when not? I believe that over time you'll get a feeling for uh, an intuition for when the torques are necessary and when they're not. A good way to do it is this. Can you solve the problem? Now, if you have one bearing and a torque's being applied, you need that bearing torque reaction. You need it. Otherwise, you can't solve the problem. However, in this case, in this case, Let's say these bearings weren't lined up correctly, and as a result, they are applying a torque. If they're applying a torque, this problem is unsolvable. So you're going to have one unknown here, you're going to have three unknowns, and one equation. Well, it's unsolvable, so the problem will demand the assumptions. And in the real world, you have to be careful because you have to make sure that things are lined up, that you're um, looking at the bearings realistically, and uh, you know if they're going to apply a torque. But I want to mention it here that, in fact, there will be no torque applied. And that simply isn't it. The bearing could, but with this setup, they they won't. It's uh, it, it wouldn't make sense to have that in this problem. Now, let's... That said, let's sum the torques about C in the Y direction so we can find the Y component of the forces. All right, so here we go. The sum of torques about C in the Y direction. That's going to be the force of B in the X direction times the radius of CB. Okay, we're good with that. And then it's also, we're going in the negative direction, you're going to have the tension times this radius. Well, we plug in our numbers, we find out that the force at B in the X direction is 17 pounds. This means our total vector of the reaction force at force B 
is 17 pounds in the I direction plus 30 pounds in the J direction. Now I want to make one note on our free body diagram. Generally on your free body di diagram you put do put down distances. Um, I didn't want to make it too loose so please forgive me for playing a little bit fast and loose. Now that said how are we going to find the reaction forces at C? Well it's actually a lot simpler than this. We could go back through and do all that where we sum the torques about B and the uh, in the X and Y directions or we could here I've, I've uh, we could just sum the forces in the X and Y directions. Let's see what that looks like. All right here we go. What I've simply done is I've simply said the sum of the forces in the X direction is zero. Well we know let, let's let's pull our free body diagram we can just see it. All right in the X direction we have the uh, the tension all right that's in the positive x direction 69 we have the force at b that's 17 and we have the force of c okay we just sum them all together well if we do that we find that the force of c is negative 86 well what does that mean in our world in our world that means that we said the force is applying in this direction and in fact the force at C is in this direction. Now um, that said we do the same summing in the Y direction and we get that the force at C is 10 pounds. That tells us that the force at C is negative 86 pounds in the I direction plus 10 pounds in the J direction. We have it in vector format. These are the reaction forces at B and C. So we can see from this equation or from this problem that we use what we know and try and feel our way through. And the best way to feel your way through is to look at what you know and to look at what you, and then to look at what you don't know because many times what you know will say like in this case we looked at what we knew and we saw okay well A is applying some sort of torque. It's it's trying to spin this thing. What's keeping it from happening? Well, in the Z direction, there's only one thing. So that tells us that the first thing we want to do, if we can get if we can find the force, or if we know the force at A, that tells us the torque generated. We can use that to figure out the torque generated here, which will tell us the tension. From there, we can work our way through our standard beam equations. It's just in or techniques, it's just in two um, uh, dimensions now. Or I'm sorry, we have to do the beam equations in two dimensions but we can solve for our bearing um, reactions at B and C. So hopefully this gives you a good idea of how to solve these three-dimensional equations that deal with multiple types of reaction points. I am going to cover one more as I introduce centroids and center of, and center of masses, center of gravities. I look forward to seeing you on the next video when we jump into that section. Take care.